Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so, you know, this slide here, um, it's not a, not a bug, it's not a prank. Um, I put this up here as a way to kind of uh, take it to, as a mechanism for us to take a step back and kind of invoke a broader context of, of where we are in the ML timeline. So for a lot of you, you see this, and you probably think maybe like just, you know, Minesweeper, but really for the, for the folks back in 1992, Windows 3 was a revolutionary way of rethinking their business and how they could integrate the PC into everything they do. And I think we're in the same spot right now with ML where there's a real opportunity and there's a real mindset in enterprises everywhere that ML can change the way they do business and it should be integrated into everything they do. So I want you to kind of take that idea, you know, stick it in the back of your head and we're gonna come back to it later, later in the presentation. But, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit of background info on why I'm here. So, you know, Kinetica, it's a distributed database. Um, I'm the CTO and co-founder. And more importantly, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, it's a distributed database that uses GPUs. Now, the GPU is the fundamental compute device of ML. And, you know, that's, you know, how we kind of got pulled into this space. So, about a year and a half ago, uh, we, we started our sales organization. And that sales organization started going out into the field. And time and time again, they came back and said to me, you know, they're asking if they can run their ML algorithms on Kinetica. And I said, well, you know, that's weird. We don't have anything that talks to that. There's nothing in our marketing material that says we can do that. And so I, I was interested. I started listening in on the sales meetings and asking the data science teams, well, why do you want to do that? And they say, well, you know, you have data and you have GPUs, and that's better than anything else we have. So we're interested. So for me, that was kind of a revelation. And you know, I went back with my engineering team and made a lightweight execution engine where we, these teams could easily plug in. And with that basic capability, we started getting re really ingrained in some, into some heavy use cases across different enterprises. And you know, what we started to see were these similar challenges over and over again. It didn't matter what the enterprise was, didn't matter what the use case was. For ML and getting it operational, we saw the same problems. And so what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is kind of go over those problems. So the first problem is really an organizational problem. ML teams, a lot of the time, are isolated. Their hardware is isolated. Sometimes it's just some workstations under a desk. They're isolated from the data warehouse team. They're sending emails asking for, asking for feature extracts or time slices. They get them back as CSVs. And more importantly, they're isolated from the subject matter experts. So, you know, as an example, we were helping a oil and gas company do uh, better prediction on uh, uh, drill failure in wells. And this team had built, you know, a great model over six months of training data. And they were really excited to do their next phase of, of evaluation with uh, three new months of data. And as they started this evaluation, everything started to fail. And they couldn't figure out why. So they spent days going back and tracing through and figuring out that, oh, it's, it's these couple features here, these time correlated features. So then they spent another few days getting hold of a well manager, you know, someone that actually has the on the ground experience and expertise to tell you what this data means. And he goes, oh, I'll tell you what's wrong. We changed our well maintenance schedule and that's why all your stuff isn't working. So it's a simple problem, right? But we saw this, you know, repeated over and over again. And it's really driven from, you know, the lack of collaboration and the isolation of the ML team. The next big challenge we saw was kind of a skills mismatch. And the skills mismatch problem really is actually driven by the collaboration problem, but you see it concretely in a number of different cases that we're going to go over. With the skills mismatch problem, the first place you see it is in feature generation. So you need to be able to train your model against features, right? And features der are derived from data. But to get to those features, you're usually writing really complex data processing jobs. And that's not you know, what a lot of data science, te science teams are good at. Uh, you know, with Kinetica, we helped alleviate this part, and we started to get folks over this hump. But then we would get to the next major challenge that we saw that was also about the skills mismatch. So, you know, we'd get to a place where we've explored data, we've got out the right features, we've got the model that we want, and now we really want to make this an operational system, right? And so that means hitting reliability SLAs. That means hitting performance SLAs. And again, they're being at, the ML team is the one being asked to do that. There isn't a systems engineering team that comes in and you know, kind of swoops in and takes care of everything. So what, you know, we saw this, and we didn't have an answer for it. And so you know, we saw a lot of crude implementations of services getting stood up, you know, calls in the middle of the night where things go wrong because there's no alerting, there's no supervision. And the final biggest challenge where you know, it, it kind of hits a lot of different, a lot of different verticals in, in the problem case where we're talking about 
a lack of collaboration, we're talking about a skills mismatch, and really it's an open ML problem, which is being prepared for audit. You know, once we did get uh, models operational and deployed, sometimes you would get a call in the middle of the night saying, okay, we're getting really weird scores, and we need to understand why, right? And so that means going from the score to the model, to the input into that model, to the features, and then finally to the data that train that model. And you know, we were totally unprepared in having that kind of uh, audit trail ready and, and kind of uh, easy to use for folks that were you know, operationally you know, on the phone and you know, trying to understand what was going wrong. So we saw these challenges over and over again, right? And as a software, software vendor, we're, we're trying to understand okay, you know, what, what is the missing component that, that can answer all these things? And there, and there really wasn't one. So, you know, we kind of define this new style of component and we call it the ML Warehouse. And the unique characteristic of the ML Warehouse is that it, it tackles all phases of the ML workflow head on and in a completely integrated fashion. And so why is that integrated fashion characteristic so, so important? It's important because it drives collaboration. When you integrate at an engineering level very closely, you're able to make tools and systems and ecosystems that are able to drive collaboration better. And that's one of the fundamental gaps that we're finding right now you know, in, ML, in the ML lifecycle. So now I'm going to kind of go over the components you know, of the ML warehouse. The first one is a rich and powerful kind of feature generation engine. So an OLAP engine that can align data to compute capability and rapidly and easily, uh, in an interactive way, generate uh, features that are going against you know, billions of data points or you know, hundreds of billions of data points. And the interactive nature is important. I know there's Spark and, and MapReduce, but it's important that you can almost get a BI-like feel and you can also use BI-like tools to chop up this data because you get that kind of feedback loop and you get this kind of creativity multiplier between you and your team where you're starting to understand and experiment with the data and what that means for your models. The next major component is what I call the global assets tour. This is like your metadata one-stop shop. So it's got you know, data about the features that you used, you know, the versioning of that feature, the same with your model. You know, every time you've trained the model, the hyperparameters you've used, everything you need to kind of explore the data ecosystem and the model ecosystem that the rest of your ML team has, has created for you. And so making that searchable and putting easy to use tools to explore that is critical and actually you know, really can help efficiency of, of other teams as they start to reuse components you know, like features and models. On the orchestration side, on the operational enablement side, you have you know, services that will help you scale as far as on training, on model evaluation. And when you're done and you're happy with the training, you're happy with all your evaluation against all the other versions, and you want to actually do the deployment, it's a, it should be something that's click button. So again, we're trying to solve that skills mismatch, where the, the data sciences team is actually you know, fully enabled by a platform rather than relying on other people. And finally, the bindings necessary to drive audit, right? So, Audit is as much a data problem and a performance problem as it, is an, as it is an ML problem. And you know the best we can do right now is to solve that data problem for them so you can make that audit trail from data, from, data, from score all the way back to data. So this is just you know, kind of a you know, rough sketch diagram of what an ML warehouse might look like. The key thing to take away is you know, you've got RESTful services on all the major components and you've got that OLAP engine, and you've got data aligned to the GPU, and a data orchestration service that allows for data to be constantly aligned with the GPU no matter what your you know, workload is. So raise your hands here if you heard about Michelangelo three weeks ago. Okay, so not, not a lot of people, that's good. Um, but Michelangelo was a platform released by Uber uh, internally, but they actually put out an article uh, in their blog that you know, kind of goes over the exact same problems we just outlined here and comprehensively you know, shows how they are solving them. Now the key difference between Michelangelo and what we do is that OLAP engine and that feature generation engine, which I think is you know, a key differentiator, but you know, the fact that someone has thought about this and cited the need, and that someone is Uber, and they put ML you know, so central to everything that they do, I feel is an enormous validation for the need for this in enterprise. As ML becomes more and more prevalent, enterprises are going to need stuff like this, a platform like this to you know, increase efficiency, 
you know, reduce operational risk and increase collaboration. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so who's a, who's a good customer for this? I mean, people who have, uh, are, you, are you finding, I think you mentioned you come originally from the intelligence yeah. world. Um, who are the best industries for something like this? Well, I mean, it can be any enterprise. I mean, we've seen a, a lot of traction with retailers. Um, we've seen a lot of traction in, in the energy sector with oil and gas. But I mean, it, it can be applied to you know, any enterprise that's really trying to integrate ML in an operational way. You know, when it's no longer like a science experiment and you need to bring it into reality, there isn't like an end-to-end -to -end tool chain that can support that right now. Okay, and just to make sure I understand, so you're trying to uh, replace the other frameworks, the MapReduce or the Spark? So, yeah, I mean, my, my basic premise is that those frameworks are kind of, you know, basic execution engines and can be, you know, built, you can build an ML warehouse on top of things like that, but they're not actually, you know, they're not actually solving the ML lifecycle problem on a kind of primary objective basis. They're just generic services. Okay. And just one last, last question from me. Does, does the data need to go through ETL to get into the warehouse? So, right, so kind of a feature generation and data cleaning, it, you know, if you look at actually the, the Uber article, they actually do tackle that. And it is something that, you know, I, I kind of wavered on whether or not we should kind of include that. Most of the enterprises we've been to have things like Trifacta where they've had it, and that's part of the reason you know, we haven't started building that out, but it's definitely you know, a valid part and could be, you know, you could make the argument that it should be part of that life cycle. Okay, very good. So I'm gonna open it up to questions. I only have one mic, um, so I'm gonna run around. Ross, is this a GPU agnostic? Is it GPU agnostic? Agnostic, like NVIDIA or AMD? Uh, so it's, so that our version of the warehouse is, is built to work with NVIDIA GPUs. Do you have, do you have a partnership with uh, NVIDIA? Oh, uh, we do, we do. We work closely with NVIDIA. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we work closely with NVIDIA, um, and um, you know, really our goal is to kind of make sure most of the interactions don't involve things like CUDA, but uh, we actually have uh, kind of a back-end compute engine that takes more primitive, e you know, kind of easy to use operators, things like, you know, SQL, and converts that in into a CUDA backend uh, for optimized processing. Great. Question over there. Is it open source? No. Is it open source? No, but that's not to say that an ML warehouse solution might not come out, might come out that is open source. I mean, I'm kind of identifying the broad need for a component like this. Right. So, right. So, you can actually leverage a TensorFlow graph that you've generated directly into into our ML warehouse. Where, let's say, let's say you want to do something like a, a batch uh, inference, right? You can take your TensorFlow graph using our framework, quickly leverage it to do that batch inference and score and collect all your scores as a, a table, um, and be able to kind of do analytics on that table. And you can plug it into a number of different uh, parts of the pipeline. The basic, my kind of basic state, my, you know, basic thing I'm trying to get across is that we do, you know, uh, as much behind the scenes as possible and give you kind of lightweight API binding so that you can hook in things like TensorFlow very easily. Sorry, busy taking pictures. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question. So, is it only uh, data scientists who you want to use this platform, or like data analysts, or? Yeah, I mean, it, it could be both. I mean, it, it can also be, you know, uh, like. Uh, business org leaders who are looking to make a more collaborative experience with the ML operations that they're trying to uh, start in their own in their own enterprise, right? I mean, we're, we're trying to kind of push this idea that you, we need a more collaborative platform, right? And it's something that you know, if I'm a, even a business leader, I can log in and understand what's going on in the ML pipeline and understand what data you know you're gen you're basing this model off of. 
All right. On that note, thank you All very right. much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys.